Hello everybody and welcome to this IFSD webinar, Fundamentals of Food Freezing, sponsored by Air Products, who for over 60 years have been providing gas and equipment to extend shelf life by gas flushing, enhance temperature control through cryogenic freezing and chilling, and improving food quality and safety, as well as helping to drive sustainability targets. They have a global footprint and dedicated food experts to support. My name is Natasha Medhurst. I've worked all my life in the food sector in international technical roles in leading manufacturers involved in dry mixing, canning, extrusion and baking, so more on the heating side of things. But more recently, I've been working as scientific affairs manager for IFST, responsible for writing and curating new scientific resources for our members and other interested parties. Today's webinar will introduce the basic principles of food preservation, freezing methods and their benefits, as well as cryogenic freezing equipment options. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to IFST's webinar hub. Feel free to make comments and ask questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A function, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. This can be used in the case of any technical difficulties. You can upvote each other's questions by clicking on the button next to their question. And there'll be a Q&A session after the presentation where we'll respond to as many of these questions as possible. Our speakers today are John Trembley and Anne Callums. John is technical. John is a technology manager for cryogenic applications at Air Products and has been working in the industrial gas industry for over 30 years mostly focused on low temperature cryogenic applications and leads an advanced technology team with the focus on developing new and innovative cryogenic applications. Anne is their food cryo and water segment manager, Europe. She started her career as an associated expert for the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization in Africa. She joined Air Products in the late 80s and held roles in technical sales product management and commercial technology, developing and commercializing gas applications for the water, chemical, and also the food industries. For more information on their biographies, please look on the IFSD website. So with that in mind, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Yes, so hello. So what's the agenda for today? We're gonna to talk about food preservation, chilling and freezing, what is freezing, faster freezing, and at the end there will be some takeaways and a Q&A session. So, food preservation. Food preservation is simply said, all it's all about food processing practices to prevent food spoilage. It has been used for centuries, and examples are curing, smoking, drying. About 150 years ago, freezing processes have been developed. Nowadays in the food industry, there are mainly two freezing processes commercially used, mechanical and cryogenic freezing. Cryogenic freezing, often also called flash freezing. Now, why do we use food preservation? Mainly for five reasons. First of all, safety. We want to slow, stop down growth of food poisoning microorganisms in food. Secondary health, we want to slow down the deterioration of nutrients. Three, quality, we want to maintain texture, taste and aroma of the foods. Fourth, choice, people want to have more products available from more places, the all, the all year round. And the last one, shelf life, with having a longer shelf life, you know, food waste can be reduced and convenience can be increased. So now, food freezing. What does food freezing do with foods? Food freezing, it slows down the decomposition of foods by turning free water into ice, inhibiting the growth of make of most bacterial species. The free water is in food parameterized by the water activity, AW. So it describes the intensity 
with which water associates with various non-aqueous consistents and solids. So IW is P over P0, where P is the vapor pressure of water in the substance, and P0 is the vapor pressure of pure water at the same temperature. The higher the AW value of foods, the more microorganisms can grow. And bacteria usually require at least an AW value of 0.91 and fungi at least at 0.7. So in this table, you can, for instance, uh, see that the AV value of, uh, of milk is 0.97. And for, micro, and for microorganisms, Clostridium and Pseudomonas, it's 0.97 um, as well. So in fact, these bacteria, they can easily grow in, um, in milk, but they cannot grow in dried fruits as the AW value is only 0.5 to 0.6. So nowadays, many of the traditional preservation methods have become less popular because of the effect on taste and texture and the perception of unhealthy processes. So this makes other processes such as chilling and freezing alternative preservation techniques. So chilling and freezing, so chilling and freezing reduce bacterial growth and thermal decomposition of foods. Certain microorganisms grow better in certain temperature ranges. There are, first of all, the psychrophilic bacteria, mac microorganisms. These, these have low temperature optima between 15 and uh, 20 degrees Celsius. Then you have the mesophiles. These have mid-range temperature optima between 30 and 37. Then you have the thermophiles. These have high temperature optima between 50 and 60. And then there are the, hyper, the hyperthermophiles. These have very high temperature optima. So many nutrients are, are also temperature sensitive. And this is particularly true for foliates, vitamin C, and many of the B, the B vitamins, such as thiamine, riboflavin, and folic acid. Most chemical reactions will double for every 10 degrees increase in temperature as well. Now, chilling will not stop microbial growth or biochemical degradation. It will only slow it down. And on this slide, you can see that uh, the different phases you can see the different phases of microbial growth. The first phase is the lag phase here uh, to the left. And you can see it occurs when organisms are transferred to new medium. There is a little increase in cell. Ooh, sorry, I go too quickly. I go back to my, yep. There is a little increase in cell number. Then And then after that, there is the exponential phase where the bacterial cell division begins and cell numbers increase as an exponential function of time. Then there is the stationary phase. There is no net increase in cell numbers anymore. The nutrients are exhausted and voila, there is no further growth anymore. And then the last phase is the death phase. There is that, that happens when there is a decline in cell numbers brought about when toxins or waste produces reach a threshold concentration. And what we really want to avoid with chilling is that microorganisms not come in that exponential phase. So that there is this, that they grow in foods. So really you can see here on the right one that the lower the temperature is, the less steep the except the exponential phases and the more delayed it is. So now with freezing, with freezing, no microorganisms are known to grow at frozen food storage temperatures. Freezing and towing reduces the microbial load on a food. It prevents really microorganisms to grow further, but it does not kill all the microorganisms. So shelf life now is really no longer limited by safety factors, but really by quality. 
such as damage to texture and the development of, of flavors. Here on this graph, you can see a list of foods from the International Institute of Refrigeration with practical storage life in months for frozen foods. The lower the temperature, the more free water is frozen into ice, the less microorganisms can further develop, the longer the storage life. So for instance, for chicken, you can see uh, here at minus 24, you would have 24 months of storage life. And at minus 12, it would be only nine months. So when we freeze foods, the water turns into ice, or better said, ice crystals develop during the freezing process. The size of the ice crystals that develop during the freezing process depends on the freezing rate. Large ice crystals damage the walls of cellular foods, leading to loss of texture and to the loss of nutrients and pigments on towing. As a general rule, a faster freezing rate results in a larger number of ice crystals at the end of the freezing process and subsequently bit more da less damage to the cell structure. The following factors limit the quality of uh, the final frozen product. Ice crystal growth during freezing, ice crystal growth during storage, dehydration during storage, and lipid oxidation during storage, and the towing rate. So the dimension and compositions of the food will play an important part in determining the suitability of the food for freezing. So I will hand over now to John, who will go further into details on, on freezing. You see my screen OK? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk about freezing, um, which is obviously the process of which water within a product, within a food product, becomes ice and is further reduced to a lower temperature, typically down to minus 18 degrees C, which is the required temperature for frozen storage. But to understand freezing first, you need to understand a little bit about the energy change. So during a freezing process of a food product, an energy change takes place, and the uh, or the magnitude or the size of the energy change depends on the product and the thermal properties of the product. Typically, you have a specific heat case, which is the CP, um, which is the amount of heat per mass required to raise or reduce the temperature by one degree Celsius, and that is used to calculate the sensible heat required above and below freezing. And then you have the latent heat of fusion or the freezing stage, as we call it, where the substance is solidified or then the heat is resolved during that process. That's, and that depends heavily on the amount of water content in the food. So if we look at a typical freezing curve, this is a typical freezing curve where we have temperature on the uh, left axis and time on the, on the lower axis there. The cooling stage is the first stage where the sensible heat is removed before the freezing. And it typically occurs above the freezing point of water, zero degrees C. And then you have the freezing stage, often called the latent heat fusion. And then you have the final stage where you have the subcooling stage or sensible heat. Sensible heat after freezing, i.e. you're cooling the ice further. And these effects here on the temperature, so starting at 30 degrees, going down to zero degrees for freezing, dropping down to whatever low temperature is required for the frozen storage. So what does that mean with regard to pure water? Here's a good example. So this is an energy versus temperature curve. On the left-hand side, we have kilojoules per kilogram. On the bottom, curve, bottom chart, we have the temperature. And you can see, again, a similar graph profile. The cooling water phase, or the liquid water, is pre-cooled above the freezing point. Then you have the latent heat, or the freezing of water to ice. And then you have the cooling of the ice phase in the lower part. So for pure water, for example, you can see if you have a product at 5 degrees C, going down to minus 18 degrees C, you have something like 360 kilojoules per kilogram of energy required to, to, to overcome that requirement. So that's an example for pure water. And let me show you further what the effect of water is in food products. Here's a, um, a simple bar chart showing a number of products with various concentrations. And you can see right from a dry product like a cookie 
or up to shrimp or seafood. You can have water contents, anything from a few percent, 30 percent, 60 percent, 80 percent, or even 90 percent, and some fruits are even up to 100 percent. So the, you can see from this chart that the water dominates the, the duty or the heat load or the freezing requirement for most products. So what does that look like in, uh, in, a, in, the, in the same energy curve? That probably happened a little bit too quickly there, but you can see here, the, there's the pure water curve that I presented earlier. And now you can see a similar curve again, and this is for sort of lean beef, which has maybe 70% water content included. And you can see for the same temperature drop, of maybe plus five down to minus 18, you have now maybe 250 kilojoules of energy required compared to the 360 that I mentioned earlier for the pure water. So this is important to understand when you're calculating the energy required and obviously the efficiency of your process, <clears throat> but it's in, essentially you can see the variance difference there between the two curves. So what does this mean in, in, in reality for a cryogenic freezing process? Obviously heat removal, is associated with the freezing of the water. And as I showed before in those charts, the water represents a very large amount of the total heat load. <clears throat> Obviously the increasing or the amount of water content in the food will increase that heat load for the same, for the same case. But also increasing the inlet temperature or decreasing the outlet temperature will also increase the amount of cooling required. And finally, obviously the amount of product required to process in the, in the, in the in your process, will also increase the amount of duty required. All these are points to require to understand in a cryogenic freezing or air refrigeration process. And mentioned earlier, what are the refrigeration mentioned methods out there type? Typically there's two out there in the market. There are other similar variants, but the two main ones are cryogenic and mechanical freezing. Cryogenic is where a cryogenic liquid is used. In this case, we're talking about liquid nitrogen as the refrigeration and it's sprayed and comes directly into contact with the food. There are also some alternative systems out there which also use cryogenic nitrogen, but it's used as an indirect refrigeration of refrigerant to indirectly cool air, which is then applied to the food. And then you have your traditional mechanical refreezing technology, which uses a liquid refrigerant, which pours inside the evaporator to provide the cooling. And then that cooling is either linked through circulation of a heat transfer fluid or by air over to the propylene food, or um, <clears throat> can't quite see that on the bottom of my slide, apologies. I've got it printed here for some reason. Just bear with me. Sorry about that. Oh yes, by contact heat transfer. So yeah, there are plate freezers and mechanical freezers out there. These are cold services of contact to uh, to uh, to provide that uh, to provide the cooling. So let's talk about what is cryogenics, and that's the uh, the obviously the very low the, the area of very low temperatures. On the left hand side here, you can see a, a, a typical thermometer showing some ranges of uh, temperatures. Typical household refrigeration might be operating around minus 12 degrees C, whereas a good low temperature mechanical refrigeration unit might operate at minus 40. And then you write then into the cryogenic space where you have temperatures as low as minus 150. And actually in this case, when we're talking about liquid nitrogen, that is a boiling point of minus 196 degrees centigrade atmospheric pressure. So you have a lot more cold refrigeration energy available. And when we say, when we talk about nitrogen, what do we mean? Is in an, it's formed by a process of cryogenic air separation. And as I mentioned, it boils at atmospheric pressure of minus 196, a little bit higher at, um, at storage pressure, maybe 185, and it can provide up to 384 kilojoules or kilogram of refrigeration capacity when you evaporate liquid nitrogen from minus 196 and uh, superheat the gas up to, up to minus 20. So it's a very powerful refrigerant source. So what does that mean and in, in, in regard to the freezing process itself? And what does the ultra fast freezing actually really mean? So the, let's take you back to the freezing rate first of the product. So freezing rate means obviously the, the rate of freezing across the, the product surface into the core. It's determined by the uh, measured in centimeters per hour. 
and yeah, it's yeah, a frozen food is fully frozen when the water in the center is basically turned into ice and, that, and that's all the free water and into molecular water. The little graph here shows the kind of thickness of the surface here on the right hand side here of a strawberry. So let's talk about some commercial freezing rates that are out there in the marketplace. So there's a number of different freezing te technology and methods out there uh, in this table. We have slow freezing, which is typically seen in the bulk freezing or cold stall or cold chamber. You can see the, the numbers there. Quick freezing, maybe a brass freezer or a contact freezer. A f in increased or a rapid freezing, maybe an IQF fluidized bed, a mechanical freezer that uses a fluidized cold air process to do that. That might have a, a freezing rate of five to 10 centimeters an hour. And then we come into the cryogenic area where we have cryogenic spray or liquid immersion, where we have the freezing rate in the order of 10 to 100 centimeters per hour, as you can see an infinite number compared with the original slow freezing. And that prevents a lot of, that provides a lot of advantages in, in, in processing and freezing of foods. So, as mentioned, so this freezing rate, how critical is that to the to the product? So the free the critical freezing time is the time to drop the temperature from um, you know, ambient to down to, or chilled temperature down to frozen. And you can see on the left hand chart here. Apologies, the units are in degrees Fahrenheit on the left hand side here, but um, essentially you have a critical freezing zone between zero and five degrees C, where most of your cellular damage can occur in your food product. So obviously minimizing the amount of time in this zone is key. And you can see on this graph here that the, the speed of cooling in freezing rate per hour for, for a liquid nitrogen based system compared with a shelf frozen system um, is, is, is infinitely different. And you can see the amount of time spent in that critical freezing zone is key. And that's when the damage occurs. As I said on the right hand side, you can see yes, so slow freezing can take anything up, but up to 19 hours or above 19 hours, rapid freezing might be less in a few minutes. And obviously, quick freezing is, in, is something in, in the middle. So we, in the cryogenic process, you're minimizing your time in your critical zone. Therefore, you're minimizing the chance of this freezer damage occurring. Let's have another look again at freezer rate with regard to ice crystal size. So higher freezing rate creates the, the smallest ice crystals. These ice crystals stay, stay intact during the, during the freezing process. They don't then um, grow within the process and they keep the intercellular structure of your product intact. Therefore, you have less damage and less uh, moisture loss when thawing. On a slow freezing process, the ice crystals tend to migrate together and grow at their own rate. And those thin ice crystals would expand and cause intercellular rupture, more damage. There's some references there that you can see, but essentially the faster the freezing rate, the smaller the ice crystal, the smaller the ice crystal, the less intercellular damage and the better the product is after, after thawing and cooking later. Sorry, I'm jumping too many slides. Uh, I mentioned earlier, so so a key another key point is the uh, the drip loss or, 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 the, or the moisture loss during evaporation or during thawing. So frozen foods lose moisture during freezing process, and this is called evaporation or or dry loss. And then when you have the thawing effect, you have the liquid loss when you when you when you melt and reconstitute the food or 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 thaw it for cooking. Generally, high cryogenic freezing rates both reduce evaporated cooling weight loss. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in my next slides. So as I mentioned, special considerations are moisture. So in the freezing process, you know, it's seen that mechanical freezing can add, will create up to 10% weight loss due, due to loss during that mechanical freezing process during to the time. In cryogenic freezing, we, def we don't see that at all because the freezing rate is much faster. So the, the losses are, are much slower and can be up to 10 times less. So here's the little start, here's some data that we have from a study that was recently done. So this is loss of weight, lot of different freezing and defrosting processes for cured ham. You can see on the left-hand side of the table there, so minus 20 degrees C freezing and then microwave heating afterwards, minus 40 tunnel with microwave heating afterwards, and then liquid nitrogen with microwave heating afterwards. You can see the freezing loss in each case is 0.5 for the minus 20 and as low as 0.08. 
so three times less in the cryogenic process or liquid nitrogen freezing process and then the defrosting loss after warming you can see is a lot less less too so these results prove that the um you know, the freezing rate is key to the loss during the freezing process and then the loss during the the, the defrosting afterwards one of our key points I mentioned it all as well is obviously cryogenic freezing can produce high quality products during 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 production, but obviously poor storage and um, transportation and in and poor control of the product afterwards is not going to help. So a key part of the any kind of process is making sure not only do you get the freezing step right, but you also get the storage, the transportation, or the cold chain process right to the user point correctly. Otherwise, you get you will get adversity in your product during that process during um, with ice crystal growth product dehydration tough and oxidation and then obviously higher drip loss when thawing so ice mobility is key to know during the cryogenic storage and transport and so it can cryogenics can provide that quality but it's key to understand that the rest of your process as well Other operational considerations to think about with regard to operation is time and you know, freezing time. So you can see on this chart here, using air, air temperature minus 20, using CO2, which is another method of freezing or liquid nitrogen at minus 100 degrees C, you can see because we've got temperature on our side, we don't necessarily see, need a higher velocity of air to achieve the rapid freezing. The temperature difference is, is high enough to still achieve that without damaging your food. So basically, the bigger the temperature difference, the faster freezing rate. And then let's talk about time, and that represents into time here. I've got a chart here that shows some freezing rate of a beef steak. So these are 200 gram steaks, two centimeter thick. And this gives you an idea of a typical freezing time for a mechanical freezer operating at minus 20 degrees C, a cryogenic tunnel at minus 40 degrees C, and a cryogenic tunnel at minus 80 degrees C. You can see quite a significant amount um, reduction in freezing time, which can obviously then impact in your operational process. 142 minutes for a mechanical freezer, for example, down to eight in a cryogenic tunnel. What does that equate to in reality? You know, that, that obviously then can equate into the foot face footprint. So, for example, for freezing um, burgers, at some, beef burgers at something like two two thousand kilos an hour, your total footprint for a mechanical freezer might be something like sixty-two square meters, compared with a cryogenic freezer at nineteen square meters, and the same kind of ratio for the smaller foot, smaller throughput. So, a smaller footprint required. So, if you have a large manufacturing space. Yeah, you can do some mechanical or cryogenic. If you have a small manufacturing space or you have limited floor space, then a cryogenic solution would be ideal for you. So some of the attributes associated with that ultra, ultra rapid cryogenic freezing are, as I mentioned earlier, much lower dehydration than mechanical freezing. You have minimal drip loss, less tissue damage during freezing, and that yields to improved quality in terms of flavor, texture, and appearance. You know, your structure of your products is intact. And associations with the equipment itself, obviously you can have a reduced floor space for your equipment, less handling losses of the products, high flexibility, high throughput, relatively low investment cost and low maintenance cost. So with a cryogenic solution, you know, you, you, yeah, <clears throat> you don't have to invest too much money in, 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 in large mechanical refrigeration systems you know it's a simple tunnel um, and that operates with a small cryogenic storage tank outside and i'll give you some explanation of that in some later slides oh yeah here we go so a little bit of a busy slide i'll give you a chance to digest that so this is a typical sort of cryogenic installation you would have a storage tank this white vessel outside which is where your liquid nitrogen is stored delivered to by a liquid nitrogen tanker um, and filled up on a, on a regular basis. That liquid nitrogen is then stored and controlled under its own, under its own pressure and control. Um, and our safety systems is then piped in, so into your factory and then the liquid nitrogen can be evaporated via a control device or control system into your cryogenic freezer. 
here is shown as a production line here with um, pizza looking devices, pizza looking food going through your tunnel. So your tunnel goes through here, is frozen and can be packed, can be packed and um, taken off for transportation later. So quite a simple setup, um, easy to, um, to operate. Um, <clears throat> yeah, simple, simple process. What, what does the cryogenic freezers look like? So um, yeah, at Air Products, we offer cryogenic freezing solutions. Here's a couple of images of some freezers that we developed. Uh, they're, they're tunnel type freezers. So the products are loaded in on the loading table here. They transfer through the product, through the, uh, the tunnel itself. The nitrogen is evaporated inside and vented off to atmosphere. Phase change between the direct contact of the nitrogen and the food and the food comes out frozen. These, this is what we call our multi-purpose freezer. This is a normal standard freezer. And the one on the right hand side is actually a freezer for creating IQF products. So that has more flexibility so it can be um, used to generate individually quick frozen products. They're used by lots of most leading food manufacturers that are using those today. I say it's a direct cooling system and they operate anything in the range of minus 70 down to minus 120 degrees C. So how, how would you decide what the right solution is for you? So the, you know, in the different freezing technology, if taste, texture, appearance, smell, moisture are all keen to you, keen to you, you're limited in floor space, or you have a product which is um, susceptible to damage, et cetera, then, then cryogenic solution is, is the one, is the best solution for yourselves. And I think that's um that's I've come to the end of my 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 slides. So excellent, thank you both. Really interesting, engaging, and also really clear explanations. Thank you so much. So yes, we're now going to move on to the Q and A session. So just a reminder: some people already asked some questions, but you can submit those through the Q and A function, which should be at the bottom of your screen. If you hover over that, um, if you've got a mouse or touch touch screen um, and you can upvote so if you see a question you think is pertinent then you can vote to that one and it goes to the top of the list and more likely to get answered um, so the first question i'd like to ask you Anne, um, mm -hmm. it's been mentioned that nitrogen is an inert gas so are there any food safety risks when freezing with liquid nitrogen Regarding fa on, on food itself, food, food safety, yeah. no, really, because as you said, uh, nitrogen is an inert gas, so it has it's colorless, odorless. It is really it does not harm, eh? uh, let's say, the food um, itself. Now, what you can say, you could you could of course overfreeze the food eh? and that's something else and you could have some impact on the quality of your food but this has eh, no safety eh? really no no safety impact uh, on on the food okay. john i don't know if you want to add something <clears throat> yeah it's very nothing to add okay brilliant thank you so much um and the next question so if people haven't tried it before and they wanted to do some small batch trials how, oh, John, do you think they'd be able to do that, to be able to check the viability of the process against what they're normally using? Yeah, well, we actually have a testing capability in the UK, so we can actually run trials for customers, or we can actually have some, we have some mobile food, cryogenic food equipment that we can take to the customer site. Sometimes transporting the product to our facility can have other effects on the products so sometimes it's always good to do that freezing step at the at the point of use or the point where it's made so we, yeah we can offer trial capabilities either within our R&D center or we can actually come to customer sites and actually do it in situ and they can actually see the benefits there again on the quality on their food great and then compare with what they're <clears throat> yeah they're compare with their current process yeah. yeah that's good thank you very much um so i'm looking at the questions that are flocking in from the audience and at the moment the most popular one is around nutrition so you mentioned about cell damage and quality impacts you also did touch on nutrient uh, impact but not too much on that so is it possible you could expand a little because the question is does the freezing process itself damage the nutrients in food john you take the review yeah okay no no i can start uh so 
what happens? Okay, nutrients or the nutrients that are in the food are in the water phase. So, you know, if we lock them, if they are locked in quickly, they, they stay in the food uh, as long, as much as possible. So that's one thing. If you allow them to disappear, they're going to disappear. That's for sure. So, you know, fast freezing, the, just the, if the process of fast freezing really helps to keep nutrients in food as much as possible. Of course, as I said, some nutrients are affected by, eh, by temperature and eh, can, eh, uh, can, yeah, can, can decompose, but it's rather the high temperature that has an effect on uh, nutrients and the low temperature. The high effect rather destroys them, but the low temperature rather makes them, uh, conserves them, yeah. That's my answer. If Your that's... answer, yeah, that's clear. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so a lot of your visuals were around um, individual products, so strawberries and that sort of thing. So the question is whether you can freeze inside the packaging, and if so, what would be the specific requirements of the substrate of the packaging to enable that? So for you, John. Yeah, yeah, you can. There is, there is. We can do freezing. We can freeze packaged products, but generally, most people tend to do the freezing before it and then packing after because then you want to control the atmosphere according to your frozen product. So it can be done, but obviously the packing then represents an insulation effect, and so that can have effect on your overall economics. So most people tend to tend to freeze and then pack afterwards. Then they can control the, uh, you know, the, as I say, the, the atmosphere according to the product. So it can be done on a bulk scale, but generally it's more individually, individual products based and then packed afterwards. I suppose it would reduce package wastage as well yeah, because yeah, you just yeah. pack what you yeah, want. Well, yes, on some packages, you don't, you don't want the package to start cracking and doing the, doing the cryogenic mm -hmm. steps. So it's, it's a case of getting the right, and also you wouldn't get the right freezing rate either. The package can provide an insulation effect and you wouldn't get the freezing, the same, the benefit of the same freezing rate in the product. Okay, thanks. So there's a question about cost, <laughs> as you'd expect. You did say that it's low investment. Um, is there anything you want to expand on that? Because the question is the cryogenic technology expensive. So could you give a bit more of a, a quantification to that, that perhaps? Yeah, again, it depends on the it depends on the application and, and the requirement. But um, most of these most of these food food equipment that we offer are, are very flexible so you can very quickly start up in it within in a small freezer and scale up to a large freezer without having to have a large investment to, to you know to, to 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 meet your final production requirements so it's very good for startups or new ideas so you want to do some product valuation first you don't have to invest in it so from a cost perspective there that that that, that is better in the beginning obviously there is a consumable further down the line the nitrogen has a cost associated with it but um, as I, our, our job is to make sure that we design the most efficient and cost-effective process for the customers. So that's a key part of our our, our, our part that we bring to the customers. Yes, yeah, it's your challenge. And um, yeah. that's yeah. good. Um, and just, just sorry, Natasha, if I, yeah. just to, to add on that, uh, another thing is also the overall maintenance cost and all of that, it's really low with, uh, with cryogenic installations. So because it's, yeah, it's... It's very, there are no heat exchanger or whatever, so a very, costs on that side are very low as well. Yeah, sorry to add. No, that's fine, it's a good add. So um, again, the, the diagram for instance looked like it was showing pizzas and we've talked about solids. So the question is, can you use it for freezing liquid, liquid? And they've given a specific example of coconut water. John, you're on mute. Still on mute. You're you're on mute, John. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, we we actually we actually are running. Actually, we're running some trials with coconut water at the moment. So yes, <laughs> yeah, we can do liquids. We have different types of conveyor belts, and obviously it's a depositing challenge, but that can be overcome. But once you can, if you can lay it on, it can be done with liquids. We have some inline processes as well. So cryogenic is very is a freezing is very adaptive to to many different requirements. So yeah, the bulk of our projects are individual pieces of food, but um, we have done liquids as well. So yes, it can be done. And if you want to send me your details, I'll happily follow up with those afterwards, no problem. Thank you. 
Um, from an environmental point of view, if you compare mechanical and cryogenic freezing, is there a, a, one of those which is better for the environment than the others, do you think? Um, it depends from which angle you, I won't say from which angle you see it, but for instance, liquid nitrogen, the basis is air. Air is the, you, you make liquid nitrogen from air, you compress and you liquefy the air. For that, you have to use electricity. And of course, you know, we try as at products to use as many green electricity as possible. So from that perspective, it's, it's good for the environment when you use in your production phase green electricity. Secondary, we have to bring the liquid nitrogen to customers with a truck. So your truck eh, has to uh, has to use, I would say, um, um, uh, a, a source to drive. Uh, my English is now going away. <laughs> uh, the the, the di not the diesel, but um, a carburant which is uh, sustainable. So hydrogen and, and all of that. So from that perspective, liquid nitrogen is really environmentally friendly. On the other hand, it has no, on the other hand, on top of that, it has no um, depletion carbon, it has no carbon depletion, uh, warming, yeah, 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 yeah. warming depletion, so it has no, eh? it is really, it does not harm the ozone, uh, the ozone uh, yeah. at all. So that's, that or two things. If you look then to mechanical freezing, you use uh, purely, uh, you, you use, uh, f yeah, let's say uh, refrigerants and these refrigerants can be harmful for the atmosphere. It depends of course, which ones you're gonna use. So, you know, it's, yeah, there is, how would I say, there are several arguments in the argument there. Yeah, yeah, I think if you want to add, yeah. A key, yeah, a key point there is also yeah, that there's a cost of production, a cost of transport. Once you have it on your site, there's no further impact in the, on, on the environment. Whereas, you know, in a refri mechanical refrigeration system, you still have to replenish your refrigerant. There could be leakage. There's maintenance associated with that. So, yeah, you, yeah, it is generally, I would say, it is a more greener product overall. <laughs> and being a lot faster as well would be yeah. a plus point. Okay, thanks for both explaining that. And from a safety perspective, so I guess that would um, mostly be from the operators, the people involved in the manufacture. Um, anything specific to note for cryogenic freezing? Um, yes, uh, in, in that sense that uh, as for all, let's say for all, um, Equipments and technologies, there are safety measures to, to take. Liquid nitrogen is not a dangerous product, but there are some safety measures to take. For instance, just um, a quick one, as the temperature is cold, you know, as an operator, you would not... Uh, you don't want to touch uh, frozen, I've had a liquid nitrogen. So very, it's a very simple one, but eh, let's say the safety measures you have to take are obvious. It's regarding the cold temperature and it's regarding uh, the uh, moving the oxygen away, the, the potential um, asphyxiation hazards, but there are measures to take as in all, for all technologies. John, you want to add here? Yeah, yeah. well, air, air products prides itself on with our safety records, so we take it very, very seriously. So, yeah, yeah. It, 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 as Anne says, liquid nitrogen is a safe product, but there are, just like in anything, there are things to be risked to be aware of. We make sure we provide the right training and the right safety systems for customers, because, yeah, some, some people aren't aware of those, and that, that's a key part of our, our offering, providing the safety awareness and the training before we would even start a customer up with a, with a, with a cryogenic yeah. installation. All right, so keeping on the topic of safety, um, are you aware of any studies that have been carried out to highlight any effects on humans or even animals? Good question. Uh, probably there would be studies, but yeah, I'm not really aware about uh, some studies. <laughs> It's quite a specific yeah, one, so yeah. don't worry. It was um, that one. Yeah. no problem. Yeah, okay, totally understand. 
Um, we often we do often get the question from people saying, you know, is, is, is yeah. there a further impact of the nitrogen because you're delivering a product to site, you store it in a tank, you put it through a you put it through a freezing process, then you vent it off to atmosphere and it can be seen as a cloud, but it's only but it has you know nitrogen is part of the air we breathe. So I don't think there is any studies that I know of that actually talk about any additional impact after processing, if that's what the question is. It's, yeah. It, yeah, it sounded like yeah. Um so more back on the technology now so fluidized bed freezers could you just give a top line explanation of what they are please yeah a fluidized bed freezer is a is a basically a freezing process or freezing device that doesn't really have a conveyor to transport the, the product through so the product is levitated on the air inside so it fluidizes and so you have a high contact of your air to your product so that can create a higher heat transfer um, and then that can have other in certain products that can have benefits um, I think a lot of the vegetables are done in that way. Um, uh, for example, so they're very, very small individual products. So that's what it says, a fluidizing process of so the cold is fluidizing the product and motive, motive, allowing it to motive through the process. Does that so is there sense? a particle size requirements? So you're talking peas, sweet corn, that sort of size. Yeah, if it's too fine, then you're going to get dust issues because you, you know, you're, you're blowing air through something. It's, you know, I can describe it, you know, do you remember the air hockey tables that used to get at the fun fairs? It's like, it's like something like that, but your, your product is riding on a bed of air. And that's the kind of heat transfer process in a fluidized bed freezer. Okay. Um, so there's a question about size limitation for a product to be a frozen. So let's think bigger than the fluidized beds now and just think tunnels and, and so forth. So um, kind of biggest normal product that you <laughs> had challenged with. We do some whole whole poultry pieces. Mm. You know, we have customers that feed whole whole chickens. Um, if you're talking about carcasses of beef, that, that would, might be more difficult. But, um, but generally, they're not. Yeah, they, they can be done. Yeah, it's just a limit. It's just a question of size of, of your equipment, really. And then space. Anything to add, Anne? No, I would say theoretically there is no limit. Practical, there is. <laughs> that's the, <laughs> that's the yeah. point. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, and on the back to food safety point of view about hygiene, how hygienic are the tunnels and how can they easily be cleaned? John, I leave it to you. Yep, yep, good question. Yeah, good question. Yeah, well, yeah, all, all our all our tunnels are designed with hygienic design from, from first principles. So um it's all accessible. Um uh, there's fortunately there's minimal moving parts in a cryogenic freezer, just the conveyor or or the device for transferring the product. So it's very easy to get in to open it up and get inside and clean it and see it. Um so we yeah, we we wouldn't we, we see mark all our equipment ourselves and then we follow the hygiene standards to do that. So um, yeah, every, every customer is, is, is different with regards to their requirements, but yeah, most we have to offer a, a fully hygienic solution onto the market. So yeah, it, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, that goes without saying almost. So. Yeah, I suppose uh, thinking of um, in-place cleaning compared with shutdowns, yeah, a lot of yeah. equipment, you could have a, a shutdown on a, on a down day, yeah, but on yeah. freezing to get down to that um, te workable temperature, say, would be quite a challenge for the operators. Yeah, 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 no, no, actually, well, not, not, yeah, if you run a freezer for a long period of time, then it would be very cold and you've got to wait for that freezer to warm up before you would then clean it. So we do have some situate, we do have some systems in our food tunnels where you can do some cleaning place to allow that to save some time because yeah most food customers want to process as many hours as they can mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and um so the, the the hygiene window is minimal so we try and so we design our equipment to so we allow the hygiene to be done as quickly as possible some in some is it's not a cleaning place as such it's more of a sort of a yeah it's an integrated cleaning you still would need to open it and do a final final wash down but you can do a block of the cleaning while it's closed yeah. And you already said that there'd be no micro growth anyway, and so it's probably more physical contamination you're thinking rather than micro cleaning at level of yeah. Clean. Okay. Um so the next question is about a safe time period for keeping food. Um you did talk about shelf life. Would you like to expand a bit on that? Um, okay, of course, as I 
as we said, first you have the, the microbial, let's say, deterioration of your foods, but yeah, next to that, you, you have on the longer term some chemical reactions, some enzymatic uh, re, re, reactions that occur. Um, okay, this is all, let's say, yeah, hap dependent on, on the food, on the storage temperature. So really there are, there are graphs and studies that say for that type of food, that's the ideal storage, uh, storage time. Uh, just, um, just to give one, one number for that food, it's not possible to say there are different factors at play. But yeah, a point to say here, it's not only the microbial damage, it's yeah, all, all the other damage that happens in, in storage as, as well. Great, okay, thank you. Um, there's a few questions around terminology used mm -hmm. in the presentation because they've been upvoted. I think it would suggest that other people were asking similar. So um, one of your slides talked about composition, protein, water content and so forth and used the term ash. So do you want to explain that? John, you're on mute. Sure, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it basically the, the the presentation was showing that obviously the the bulk of food products is water, and um, there's lots of other different components within different different solution, a different composition within that product. It's the water that has the main um, the main activity on the overall economics and the freezing cost. But yeah, that, that was more of a pictorial idea. I think there are some some products with those inside it. There might be a bit of an old slide. Apologies. Oh, no, there will be. So it's the um, inorganic, yeah, inorganic yeah. matter that's yeah, um, yeah, ignited yeah. off. So they yeah. probably weren't familiar with that um, particular analytical um, terminology. Um, and then heat load at the inlet outlet. Um, that would have been terminology on a particular slide. Yeah, he, 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 yeah, heat load. He, when, when we refer to heat load, we yeah, refer to the, the heat energy required to be removed to cool the product down to the to the required temperature. So if you have a very warm product to start with, you've got to cool all that product down to the freezing point, then freeze the ice, then, then super cool the ice if you like to get to minus 18. So the warmer the product, the higher the, the heat load on the process or the heat required on the process. Maybe it's a word that we use a lot, heat load, that doesn't really translate, but it's more the, the thermal dynamics of the process yeah okay great thank you um and then a question about the ability to refreeze as it were so the example they gave is could you freeze food made from frozen ingredients that have been defrosted been frozen before so pies that are made from defrosted pastry um yes you you can in a way that okay for all foods the the initial microbial load is important before you you start so if you use let's say frozen food for instance that has been frozen in blocks or whatever and you defreeze it and you you thaw it and you want to use the components what's important is that after the thawing process let's say the, the microbial load eh, of, of the project is, is still low, it's still in, in good eh, quality. So as I was showing in my um, spoilage, your food still has to be, has to have a low bacterial load in the leg phase and, and not, eh, not be spoiled. So then, then you could use it again. And secondary, yeah, the, the structure and the texture uh, when you defreeze your your product, when it has been frozen cryogenically before, when you thaw it, your structure, your texture, is still fine, and you can can refreeze. If it has been poorly frozen and you defrost it, you start with a poor structure, a poor texture. Yeah, very difficult to do. So again, there is no there is no one answer. It depends on several. Uh, yeah, several things. Yeah, it depends on the components. Yeah, okay, exactly. thanks for explaining yeah. that. It was a tricky question, but I just thought because um, people are asking, yeah. it's worth to include that because it probably happens in their situations. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a good one about uniformity. So when you've got freezing occurring in the tunnel, 
Um, I guess it depends on what type of food, how complex it is, but they're asking about uniformity of the freezing guaranteed in the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we actually map all our freezers with regard to the heat transfer performance. So we have a we, we, yeah we balance out. So you, so you, yeah, if you have a large, um, a relatively small product and a large built in a long tunnel, you want to have a, an even heat transfer rate all the way down the tunnel. So yeah, that that's something that we pride ourselves in our technology. We have a very um, efficient heat transfer process in our fan design and our air circulation in our freezer to make sure we have an even consistent freezing rate across the build. Okay, thank you. And um, we talked about liquids, we talked about solids, but this is combination is freezing food inside brine feasible? Freezing, well, <laughs> yes. If, and, and anything's freezable is just a question of cost and time, but um, we, we do have some customers that brine coats and products and then they're frozen cryogenically. They're, you know, there's a need to understand that, that layer on the surface, but if it's, if it's immersed, yeah, are they talking about a capsule or something? Maybe I'm just trying to envisage the question. It's possible. Yeah, it's po it's possible. It's a question of a question of um, freezing rate and um, getting 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 the cold through the brine layer into the product. So we'd have to model it, but I think it would be possible. Yes. Okay. Um, so I I've noticed the time and, and we're getting tight on that. So was there a specific question you happen to notice in the Q and A that you'd like to approach, or do you think? We've covered a great cross section of uh, topics there, I think. Um, just one thing I saw, I don't see the question now anymore, but about control, controlling and uh, efficiency. So in fact, yeah, what happens now, all cryogenic freezers and products is um, deliver, if I'm not, yeah, is delivering has uh, remote control possibilities so really you can optimize your process uh, to to the best efficiency using this uh, remote process uh, control um, uh, options just wanted to add yeah that's a good point thank to you. end yeah. on yeah. yeah thank you for that so thank you both John and Anne for um, great presentations today and if we didn't manage to answer your questions then please contact our speakers directly their details on the screen there and um, we'll share a recording of the webinar, including this latter Q&A session to everyone who attended today via email. And it will go on our online webinar hub on the IFST website. Before you log off, if you could be so kind to fill in the short questionnaire, which will launch immediately after the webinar ends, that will be really useful feedback for us. And I'd like to thank you again so much. And and John for everything you've done for attending um, and presenting today and also for all the attendees across the world. Big thank you to Air Products overall for sponsoring this webinar and I wish you all a good day. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You thank, you. thank you. Thanks to all. Yeah, bye. Thanks. Bye.